I'm going to invite any kids who would like to come up, to come up just for a quick minute. Okay, and this is something I want all of you to do. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute, and I'm going to say the word church, and I want you to see what you imagine. Just pay some attention to everything that comes to mind when I say church. Okay. What are some of the things that came to mind for you? Yeah. A church. A church. Like, what part of the church? Like the building? Yes. The building, okay. Yeah? Oh, the building. Yeah. Anything else? Well, that's what, yeah. Crosses. Crosses. So that's what most people imagine when you say church. You say a church and you think a building. Well, Back when the, uh, this letter to the Ephesians was written, they didn't really have a lot of buildings. They thought of themselves, the people, as the church. And you all had a lesson in Sunday school on the peaceable kingdom last week, right? You learned about how the wolf would lie down with the lamb and God's kingdom and peace and harmony and love would reign. And that's actually more what the church is supposed to be. Not just a building that we go to, but a peaceable kingdom that we build and create. And our reading from Ephesians is a little bit confusing, but we've got a picture here. We're going to post up here. What do you see that in that picture? What makes up the church? People. people. And it's not just any people. It's people who have come together and even though they hold on to their differences, they let go of the things that make them divided. They let go of hatred. They let go of what the, the uh, letter calls hostilities. And when we come together in love and peace, we create a church that is not just a fancy building or a fun place to go, but is actually the home of God. It says that God comes to dwell with us when we let go of our hostilities, we get to be the house that God lives in. Now, I know you guys are really into Legos. I didn't want to bring the Legos up here because they were going to be really loud. But if during the service you would like to go back to the table back there, I've got some of my Legos here, and you are invited to build a picture of the church like we've been talking about if you want to. You don't have to, but you can so I invite you to go back there or go back to your seats and just think about what the church is when we are a house for God, when we come together in love and peace, okay? All right. <laughs> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one, and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us, says our reading from Ephesians. That word, that dividing wall, would have brought to mind pretty clearly in the mind of the early readers of this letter the outside wall of the Jewish temple, where an inscription warned Gentiles not to go beyond the outer court of the temple, lest they be immediately put to death for profaning the holy place. What a profound image. That wall that had separated the clean from the unclean, the holy and chosen from the profane and discarded, is knocked down. And now all have access to the inner rooms of the temple where the divine dwells. And not only that, the reading goes on to say, but when we allow the walls that divide us the hostilities between us to dissolve, then we ourselves, our community of once divided people, become the temple, God's holy dwelling place. In a world where hostilities between people increasingly seem to be the norm, this passage is a clarion call to the church to be something different. In his statement after the shooting last week, Episcopal presiding Bishop Michael Curry ended with this line, I pray that we as a nation and a world may see each other as the beloved children of God. This is the shocking reality that Ephesians is pointing to. In the church, we affirm that we are all one humanity 
We are all beloved children of God, called to come together around the table, right and left, evangelical and progressive, of all races and ethnicities, of all gender identities and sexual orientations, of all classes and ages and anything else that might divide us. In the church, we are called to affirm our shared belovedness as God's children, to work for one another's good, and by so doing, to become the literal, holy dwelling place of our God. This may seem like a foolish dream, but it is what will ultimately save us. As theologian George W. Strop says, the peace Christians have in Christ enables us to engage boldly, perhaps even foolishly, in what may appear to the rest of the world to be a hopeless situation. Hope in this reality can change the world, and we've seen it in the legacy of Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, and so many others who have brought liberation and peace where there was none, we see the kind of change this hope can bring. Now, this peace we give our allegiance to is not a cheap peace created by ignoring or excusing injustice or prejudice or anything else that harms our world, but it does require us to take this passage seriously. The idea that Christ's peace is already here, inviting us in, inviting us to eat and touch and be in reconciled community with one another, even when hostilities make more sense. When we engage one another with Christ's heart for all people, we create a new world. We live into the peace that Christ himself is offering to us. I don't know what this means for all of us practically, but I do know, for example, that this means that I must somehow treat my neighbor with true agape. Even my neighbor across the street who has forbidden his children from playing with mine because we are a part of the LGBTQ plus community. He is a beloved child of God. And though he does not recognize my belovedness, I must recognize his and pray that agape will transform both of our lives and our world until that dividing wall falls as do all others. I do know it means that I must speak up when I see prejudice, racism, classism, that I must feed the hungry, work for an end to violence, and I must do so with agape in my heart, even for my enemy. This is not easy work, but I have to seek to be transformed by Christ so that I can do it. Our gospel tells us that even the smallest brush against Jesus' cloak healed the crowds who rushed to him. Even the smallest brush with God's love, God's agape, can heal our shattered hearts and world. As people of faith, citizens not primarily of any nation, but first of the kingdom of God that transcends all borders, we must do our best to live into a reality we cannot yet entirely see. We must live into the peace of Christ. We must live into the reality of his kingdom come and his will done on earth as it is in heaven. And we do not need to just brush up against Jesus. We do not need to just have a fleeting encounter with the almighty, everlasting love of God. Instead, brought together by the peace of Christ, we can literally be the place where the divine, where agape dwells. The beauty of faith is that it frees us from fear of what we encounter in the present moment. It allows us to see that which is beyond, that which, however foolish it may sound, is infinitely more real and more true than the present reality we can touch and see and feel. We see violence and division, hatred, hostility, and sickness. But God's love, God's resurrection, the peace of Christ, the wholeness of God, they are the reality we are called to see, to live into, and witness to as we work to be the very body of Christ that feeds and heals this world with every encounter, just as Jesus did as he moved 
through the desperate crowds today in our reading. As we work together to be the church, reconciled humanity held together by the love of God embodied in Christ, we can grasp onto hope even when it seems that love is not winning. Because each step we take as we follow Christ paves the streets of the kingdom of God. Each act of peace, each act of justice, each act of love, no matter how piddly they seem in the face of the world's ills, build the very dwelling of God. So be not afraid, be not discouraged. Look at others with the loving eyes of Christ, love them with the heart of Christ, and together we will witness God's peace enfolding all of us, near and far, reconciling us finally into one humanity, connected as beloved children of God. So today, as we offer one another the peace of Christ, let's remember this. We are not simply offering one another a greeting. As theologian Edwin Searcy says, the peace of Christ is a shocking new reality in which former enemies who would not touch or eat with one another now reach out to one another in recognition of their common humanity. The destruction of the dividing wall that has been accomplished by Christ is good news for our divided selves, our divided households, and our divided workplaces. More than that, it is good news for the whole world. So my friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. And may it be with our whole broken world. Amen.